go ahead and talk about, of course, what we'll get into today and uh, discuss. Uh, you know, between the war, war wars, you know, you have the rise of fascism that starts in Europe. And I'll kind of get to that because you get these dictators like uh, Benito Mussolini, uh, Adolf Hitler that rise to power. So we'll, we'll kind of get, get to that today and talk a lot about uh, these fascists that come to power. So they do kind of cause, you know, the outbreak of World War II, uh, especially Hitler, you see over my shoulder. Uh, he's Adolf Hitler is one of the main causes, of course, of why that occurs. I'll get to Japan later. You know, you got fascist Japan or militaristic Japan. Probably talk about that later in the week. Uh, they, they also help cause uh, World War II uh, to break out in Asia and the Pacific. So I'll get to that later and discuss that later more into the week, like I said. But yeah, if you have any comments, questions, of course, about the lecture, you know, please let me know in the live stream where you can always leave me comments, questions, of course, on my channel. Uh, you can also, you know, subscribe to my channel as well below, uh, you know, right there. So anyway, um, kind of talk about, of course, you know, get into the rise of, you know, fascism in Europe. Um, yeah, yeah, Adolf Hitler, you know, one of the most famous, you see there giving the Nazi salute, uh, you saw, of course, earlier. Um, yeah, there's one of the main reasons why, of course, World War II uh, broke out. And I'll kind of get into first, like, kind of what led to that. Like, what, what were the causes of why, you know, dictators like Hitler came to power, of course, in Europe. Uh, and uh, I'll kind of first talk about the Weimar Republic, which was a historical period in Europe uh, that followed after World War II. Uh, at the end of World War One, uh, you have this new state that was created right after the you know, Treaty of Versailles uh, was signed. And um, what happened was in Germany, they had this German revolution break out at the end of World War One. I. I think I told you how the Kaiser, you know, the, the monarch in, in Germany, uh, abdicated. Uh, he fled to uh, Holland, you know, the Netherlands. Uh, and, um, and then what happened afterwards, they had this... Republican government that took over, which you see there, which that right there uh, is the uh, one of the German, I guess the Western name that a lot of people call it, uh, the Weimar Republic, which got its historical name from Weimar, where the Constitutional Assembly met uh, to create this new state, which I think officially didn't really start till 1919 uh, when they signed the Constitution. And it was a liberal democratic republic. Uh, that was founded on direct representation. Uh, that meant that uh, men could vote universal, you know, voting, but also women. Women could could vote uh, as well, and also hold office, uh, you know, in the country. So men and women could could do that. And uh, it had different names. Uh, officially, uh, the Germans would call it uh, the German Reich or Deutsch Reich, uh, if you want the German name, of course. Uh, and then the German Republic is sometimes what they also called it as well, the Dutch Republic, you know, and that's that's kind of basically uh, what they dubbed it. That's one of the rulers at the top left that was there at one point that ruled over Germany, uh, which was Paul von Hindenburg. He was one of their main, main rulers. And, um, yeah, they have later presidents, of course, that they're part of this particular state. Uh, of course, on the left, you had Frederick Ebert. Ebert uh, was one of the main leaders of um, what is the um, Social Democratic Party that took power in Germany. That's the current party and the political party in Germany that really controls uh, more than anything in the state because uh, the current the current chancellor of Germany is Olaf Scholz. Well, if you know about them, these are presidents that were part of it. Uh, under, under the government, uh, they had like... Um, they had like they, they got rid of the, the monarch, if you know about this. Uh, and so they had the presidency was like the, like the ceremonial type leader. And then they had the chancellor still, which was like the kind of like the prime minister uh, of that ran the government. And so that's the, that's the, the the two heads of state that really ran or still run today Germany. So Frederick Eber on the left was like the first president of Germany. And then Paul von Hindenburg on the right was later elected as the second president. Later, believe it or not, Hitler, Adolf Hitler, was the third president and later became chancellor in what they call Fuhrer uh, over time. Uh, I'll get to uh, talk about the failures of, 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 of the Weimar Republic, which uh, the Weimar, by the way, 
uh, had um, it had different parts of its government. They had like the um, two main uh, assemblies that were kind of, it was a bicameral parliament that they had, uh, they had what they call the Reichstag, uh, which the Reichstag uh, was the main legislative body uh, where uh, members of the German people were elected directly. It was kind of like a lower house, kind of like a house of representatives, like say in the United States or maybe like a house of commons, uh, like in Britain. And then the Reichsrat uh, was really uh, a type of assembly that was like an upper house, almost like a house of lords, uh, like in Britain. And it was more like a um, type of uh, assembly where they, uh, the German states would appoint people uh, to it. And so it wasn't like direct, you know, representation, but the Reichstag was more, you know, famous. And of course, today they have what they call the Bundstag, if you know about that. Uh, that's the main uh, German parliament, or they call it a federal diet, but they dub it. That's the main assembly they have now, uh, which, in Ger which is in Germany, uh, which is a unicameral uh, type uh, assembly. But yeah, the Weimar Republic did not do well. Uh, if you know about this, it, str it struggled due to a lot of the post-war depression after the war. Like a lot of states had that. Like in the United States, we kind of went through that as well. But Germany had to pay a lot of these debts off because they owed a lot of money uh, from the war. Uh, from you know creditors, banks that they owed money uh, to, and then they also had to pay a lot of war reparations uh, to the Allies after the war, which totaled you can see there up to like seventy-two billion dollars that they owed, which is equal to almost like one trillion dollars uh, today. So you can imagine that in the nineteen twenties uh, after the war, uh, that the Weimar this this German government struggled. Uh, by the way, it got so bad uh, if you study about. Uh, uh, Germany at that time in the 20s that they had this so-called hyperinflation where because they owed so much money or whatever, the currency was worthless. And so people were kind of taking the money and using it for all kinds of things. Uh, you know, clothes, uh, kids were using it as toy blocks. Uh, you can see that woman on the top right uh, taking the money, stuffing it into a furnace uh, to keep warm in the winter because uh, wood was more expensive uh, to buy. It's kind of like now with all the inflation going on in the United States, uh, you know, and I guess Biden's administration and money, money doesn't buy as much now, you know, because of that. But it's not as bad as that back then, you know, clearly it took a wheelbarrow of money to go buy food, things like that. Oh, and then on, on, on top of that, you know, on top of the uh, inflation, you also had, you know, the rise of, you know, the Nazis. You know, we're going to have the Great Depression, you know, occur uh, by the 1930s. We've got mass, mass unemployment uh, in Germany. And so it allows these radical groups like the Nazis to eventually come to power. Uh, and so that, that's something I'll kind of talk about today. We'll get into, uh, discuss, of course, uh, the um, rise of, like, fascism, of course. Oh, that's, by the way, a million-dollar mark you're looking at there. They start printing those. That's how bad the inflation was. So imagine having a million dollar bill and it's not worth anything. <laughs> That's crazy. But anyway, uh, let's get to and talk about, of course, the rise of fascism. Let me first talk about like what what is fascism? What what exactly was it? Uh, fascism was a far right wing uh, political ideology. It became very popular uh, in between the war, world wars, uh, like in the 1920s, uh, the 1930s, and a lot of it had to do uh, with the failures of like democracy, uh, the failures of capitalism. Uh, those were the main cause of why people started to kind of look at fascism as a alternative to what they had, you know, that time. Like in, you know, I guess in Germany, Italy, Spain, uh, even you know Japan later in you know Asia, uh, and. Um, of course, one of the first fascists you have here is Benito Benito Mussolini, uh, who you see right there. I kind of got another picture of him right here, Mussolini. Uh, and um, here's another, like him, of course, giving a speech right here. Uh, and uh, Mussolini um, and the fascist movement, he was the one that kind of started it. Uh, he kind of saw it as this movement uh, that was born out of the need of action. That was his his thing about it. 
Well, it's kind of considered like a right wing political ideology, but he didn't really see it as that. I think he, I think Mussolini saw fascism as more of a populist movement uh, to try to make changes uh, to Italy to bring it back from, you know, I guess going back to ancient times like the Romans. And uh, fascism was a type of uh, right wing movement that opposed things like anarchism, uh, democracy, civil liberties. Uh, they were obviously against liberal leftist ideas, uh, definitely against Marxism. Like they hated communism. Uh, and so uh, fascism was seen as, as a movement to counter that uh, in Europe. And also on top of that, the fascists were very militaristic. They believed in building up the armed forces uh, and you know, restoring Italy to glory uh, and uh, Mussolini saw basically, um, he saw fascism uh, as a way uh, to restore Italy to this, you know, uh, power like uh, the Roman Empire. That's kind of what he kind of envisioned it, where it would control parts of the Mediterranean Sea uh, and all that. Uh, Mussolini, by the way, he's later prime minister of Italy. Uh, he rules over Italy as a dictator uh, from 1922 up to 1945. Later, they call him the Il Duce, which means uh, either the leader or really in Italian, it means the Duke. But uh, Mussolini summed up fasc fascism in a famous quote uh, that he said. He said that fascism was not the nursling of a doctrine previously drafted at a desk. It was born of the need of action and was action. It was not a party, but on uh, the first two years, an anti-party and a movement. Uh, in fact, Mussolini even th thought it was not even left or right. It was more like a populist movement is what it was. And um, I think later in more modern times, they now kind of view it as more right wing or ultra right wing, that kind of thing uh, today. It's definitely way, way right. Of course, a lot of liberal leftist movements. Uh, of course, one of the things that the fascists would do, uh, they would incorporate a lot of things uh, into their movement, uh, like the fasci, who you see there. The fasci uh, was a type of symbol which uh, went back to uh, Roman times. Uh, the fasci was an ancient Roman symbol of like power and authority. I think originally developed by, I want to say, the kings of like the Romans and then later used under the Roman Republic, uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, the word fasci uh, is a Latin term being, meaning bundle uh, because it's a bundle of wooden rods wrapped around an axe. And it symbolized that the Roman people were many, but one. Uh, and uh, of course, the fasci symbol has been used a lot uh, throughout the world, especially in the West, even in the United States has used it at one point. Uh, but uh, Mussolini, the fascists began to incorporate it more into like flags and other things uh, to kind of support their movement uh, in all that. Uh, fascism, by the way, uh, it, it merged with capitalism. So they had more of a state-controlled you know, economy where they supported the idea of having property on uh, things like that. Uh, but they weren't like the communists where they wanted to you know, get rid of capitalism and things like that. They kind of worked with some having some kind of market economy and all that and supporting even people having a lot of money as well. Same thing with Nazi Germany uh, and all that. Uh, and so, yeah, they were supportive of that, but Italian fascists probably weren't like the Nazis. The Nazis were more racist, if you know about that. Uh, I know the Italians thought they were superior too to uh, other people, but um, Germans were big into that, you know, master German race thing, you know, master race. Germans were superior to all, all peoples, you know, German science, German blood, you know, and stuff like that. Uh, they hated Jews, Slavs, and other peoples uh, that were different from them, uh, and so on. So Mussolini kind of does that, but they, they really weren't like anti-Semitic, uh, the Italian fascists. They were kind of forced to because of Hitler. Uh, by the way, um, one thing about Mussolini before he became a fascist dictator, he tried different things. He was a veteran in World War I. Uh, he was actually a school teacher for a while, ran a newspaper as a journalist, and then, believe it or not, Mussolini started out as a socialist. 
on the left and then switch to the right. That's something he, of course, of course did. Uh, there, of course, is Mussolini uh, giving the fascist salute. You know, the fascist salute, something you start seeing a lot on the 1920s uh, in the 1930s. Uh, you can see the difference between the Italian fascist salute and the guy on the kind of on that right. You can see doing the there's two on the right giving the Nazi salute uh, was a little different. Uh, they think that the uh, fascist salute evolved from the Romans. The Romans, like Marcus Aurelius, one of the famous Roman emperors, like giving a salute. They think that's the origin of where these salutes came from, and then they kind of just borrowed it uh, later. Uh, of course, Mussolini is very famous for his uh, march on Rome, well, which happened uh, later uh, in in nineteen uh, in the 1920s, 1922, uh, to be exact. Uh, and uh, he, what happened was back in 1919, uh, he formed this political party, uh, which was called the National Fascist Party, which if you want the Italian, it's Partito Nacional Fascista, or PNF is what they called it uh, for short. And uh, the Italian nationalists were trying to, you know, restore Italy to greatness. Uh, and so uh, he pushed this movement uh, throughout the country. He wanted to make, you know, Italy a major power, you know, in Europe uh, and all that. And um, he had this pair of military force uh, that was called the Black Shirts. You may have heard of it. So it's called different names. Uh, I think some people called it the Squadrissimo, I think was one name uh, they dubbed it. Uh, other others have, I think, another name for it uh, as well, which was the uh, voluntary militia for the national security, uh, which had, I think, at one point up to like three hundred thousand people in it. A lot of them ex-veterans of the of World War One, uh, and they were kind of comparable to the Nazis' SA, uh, the Brown Shirts, uh, which were under Hitler, which helped you know Hitler come to power, and uh, part of why they helped. Uh, what happened was in Italy, Italy was on the verge of like a civil war where you had fascists and Marxists fighting for control uh, of the country. And so Mussolini in October of 1922 uh, had this mass national demonstration. Um, and it was like a coup. What it was, they called it the so-called March on Rome, which I think lasted about a week, I think October 22nd to the 29th. And uh, the uh, ruler of um, of Italy, who was King Victor Emmanuel III, uh, was forced to appoint Mussolini prime minister, uh, which he did. And so he was forced to transfer power uh, to the fascists afterwards. And so that's how Mussolini got in power uh, at that point. Either that or it was civil war, uh, basically. And so Mussolini from there then went on to form a totalitarian dictatorship but then like two years, I think by 1927, he was had pretty much taken over the whole country, putting fascists all of the government uh, and all that. So, yeah, Mussolini, there's, of course, pictures of the March on Rome with Mussolini kind of on the almost on the left there a little bit. He's going to got the kind of one in the middle on the left. But uh, anyway, I want to go, of course, move on to the main thing I want to talk about today, of course, is get into. Uh, and talk about Adolf Hitler, who really, really, Hitler is the most famous figure, really, that rose to power, of course, uh, you know, between between world wars. Uh, and um, I think I've got another better picture of Hitler right here. Of course, later he was seen, you know, as Chancellor of Germany, uh, you know, totalitarian dictator, Nazi Germany between 1933-1945, also known as the so-called Third Reich, uh, and um, a little background about Hitler. Uh, Hitler was originally born in Austria. He was, you know, native-born Austria. Uh, the town, if you want to know, is Bernau, Bernau am Inn. Uh, he was born on April 20th, 1889. Uh, he kind of came from a lower middle-class background. I think his father, uh, Alois Hitler, was like a customs agent, official, dealt with like border security and Things like that, uh, and um, Hitler. Hitler uh, served later in the military. He actually uh, lived in Vienna for years. Uh, I think they say in his early life he 
attempted to become an artist, which he was a failure at. And then um, he moved from Vienna to Bavaria, like Munich, Bavaria, in the early uh, 1900s, right before World War I. I think we're going to say 1913. And uh, during the war, he served in the Bavarian army. And that's how he kind of became like a somewhat hero during the war. And his highest, his highest rank was, um, I think, Lance Corporal uh, dur during the war. Uh, what happened was after the war, Hitler joined a political party in Munich, which was called the German Workers' Party. Uh, he initially joined it to spy on it, by the way. But like what they'd have to say uh, in this political party, it was a right-wing kind of working-class political party. And within a couple of years, he became like the head of it and even, you know, changed the name of it uh, at one point. And uh, over over time, it uh, the, the name that they would, of course, adopt, adopt as you know, uh, with it uh, was the so-called um, Nazi Party, as they call it, which if you want the full name, it's the National Socialist German Workers Party, uh, NSDAP, uh, which comes from actually the German, which you see right there, Nationalistic uh, Deutsche Arbiter Party, uh, shortened, shortened from Nazi, which Nazi was a term they used, of course, uh, by by their enemies, the people that hated them, which were, I guess were more left because the Nazi party was more of a kind of a pro-German nationalist party that was more right-wing, uh, that was anti-Semitic, they hated Jews, and of course they didn't really like communists and things like that. And uh, Hitler mostly talked about this idea of restoring you know, German greatness after World War I and getting revenge for the Treaty of Versailles, uh, which he talks about the whole stab in the back thing, uh, the fact that those people that, you know, signed, signed the Treaty of Versailles uh, and, and formed the, the Weimar Republic were what he called the so-called November criminals. Uh, that's what he called. I think the Nazis always talk about that whole stab in the back thing as being something that, of course, happened. Uh, of course, the Nazi party would adopt the swastika, uh, which was, uh, I think, officially adopted in 1920. Uh, it, it does have different names. Uh, some people refer to it uh, as being called the Hockenkreuz, or the so-called Hooked Cross, uh, which they think that the swastika is a symbol which originated in the East, like in Asia, uh, which was often a symbol of a lot of your Eastern religions, uh, like Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Jainism, uh, et cetera, which were actually symbols of like good fortune, like luck. Uh, and I think Hitler saw it in a Catholic church, kind of borrowed it and uh, put the white red background on it too, uh, which you can see there. That became part of the, the German flag and other symbols that were kind of used by the later Third Reich uh, up to like World War II especially from 1933 to 1945. And it was, of course, incorporated, you know, into like other symbols, like they even brought in, you know, like the Iron Cross, which uh, represented, you know, the old Teutonic Knights that went back to medieval times, uh, which the Iron Cross was, you know, also a famous medal that they would give the you know, soldiers or heroes that uh, for great, great valor at war uh, and all that. And the eagle was also incorporated, which the eagle is something that goes back to like Roman times, uh, which a lot of empires have kind of incorporated the eagle uh, into a lot of times. So you can see the eagle being incorporated with the swastika and things like that. But you can see their swastika was a little different. It was more like at an angle instead of being more square. That's one of the differences. So I think a lot of times the in Easter, like in Asia, you'll see it more square and with dots in it sometimes even as well. Uh, now, Hitler also surrounded himself with a lot of men uh, that were kind of uh, famous and notorious for a lot of you know bad things later uh, that happened under Nazi Germany uh, in World War II. Uh, and I'll kind of go through and talk about some of these men. Some of these men are pretty famous uh, later, uh, even after the war. Uh, on the left, you had, of course, uh, Herman Goering, you may have, may have heard of him. Uh, he's, of course, a well-known figure, of course, uh, in, um, later, later in uh, World War II. Goering was the head of the German Luftwaffe, uh, which 
uh, was the German Air Force uh, from the 1930s up to uh, 1945. And uh, he was known notorious for a lot of different things. Uh, Goering was well known for developing the Gestapo. You heard about this, which was the German secret police that was pretty much in power in Germany from 1933 to 1945. Kind of equivalent to like, kind of like the Soviets, you know, the KGB or whatever, kind of like that. So a very secret police, which a lot of these fascist states had secret polices that would basically spy on people. And even neighbors would spy on you and things like that. So if you said something against Hitler, they would turn you in, uh, et cetera. Uh, so they had a lot of spies all over the place. Uh, also, they think Gehring helped develop some of the early concentration camps that would later be used, you know, during the Holocaust uh, and all that, like the cow, you know, that was famous in Germany uh, later. And so the model for like the death camps that they'll use to execute Jews and other people like that, of course, during World War II. On the right, you've got Heinrich Himmler. Uh, he was later the one that was the head of the Gestapo. So the German secret police, uh, like the 30s up to like the end of World War II, uh, he was also the head of the SS, which was called the Schutzstaffel or Protection Squadron. Uh, the SS were notorious uh, for being used as a security service uh, to basically spy on the whole state. Uh, you know, also your know, security of the state uh, as well. Uh, the SS were also notorious uh, for being involved in the Holocaust. They're the ones that ran the concentration death camps uh, during World War II. Uh, they think the Nazis may have killed as many as 10, 15 million people uh, in Europe during World War II, with maybe even up to like 6 million Jews uh, dying uh, as well. Uh, and so that's something they're kind of notorious for, uh, the SS. The SS were known for their black uniforms, uh, where they had that skull and crossbones that was, of course, on their, their caps. Uh, the SS also had these uh, elite military forces you may have heard of, which were called the Waffen SS, uh, who were pretty, pretty advanced forces uh, under Hitler during World War II. And um, they they also committed some genocide uh, during the war. Uh, part, some of them were, well, not them, they were, had some groups that were kind of similar to them, which were called like the Eitzengruppen, you may have heard of uh, during World War II, uh, which were these Nazi SS killing squads that were used on the Eastern Front. Uh, they are kind of separate from uh, like the German Wehrmacht or the German armed forces, of course, that were used uh, later in World War II. Uh, other figures that were big on our they had Ernest Rahm, uh, who you see on the left there. Uh, Rahm uh, was the head of the SA, which was the Sturmabteilung, which meant uh, in German Storm Detachment, which uh, the SA started out like really as Hitler's bodyguard, like protecting him at rallies. Uh, sometimes they would meet at beer halls and things like that. And Hitler would give speeches and they would be used to beat up people that were, you know, not Nazis and all that. And uh, Rahm went back, way back to the beginning of the Nazi party back in 1919. Uh, they were close friends, but uh, they later had a falling out uh, because Rahm was a threat to really Hitler's power uh, by the 1930s. And Rahm was notorious for being a homosexual, which kind of got him in trouble too back then uh, as well. Hitler later had him killed. Uh, but but the SA had millions of people in it. I forget, it was like several million uh, men at one point uh, joined it uh, under Hitler, but it was eventually gotten rid of uh, around 1934. You also had uh, Joseph Goebbels. You may have, you may have heard of him. Uh, he was later Hitler's Minister of Propaganda. He ran like propaganda uh, newspapers in the media, radio, and uh, Goebbels was very famous for using propaganda to control the whole population of Nazi Germany. They helped that to push all this ideology on the German people to brainwash them. And that's part of why the Germans kind of went along with the whole Holocaust thing, you know, killing Jews and other people's because uh, they thought they were considered lesser people, lesser humans, or even non-humans. I think they even said the Jews were like vermin or cockroaches, and you can kill them and things like that. And so Goebbels, Goebbels had a lot to do with that. 
Uh, also, you may have heard of Martin Borman. People don't really hear much about him sometimes, but Borman was really one of uh, Hitler's closest henchmen. Uh, that was pretty important, especially during World War II. He's the one that practically ran the Chancellery Building uh, in in Berlin uh, during World War II. And so he he was really considered to be one of Hitler's top men uh, that was under him. Uh, the other ones were Goering and Himmler. It's kind of a debate about which one was number two behind Hitler, but Marmon was pretty big. Uh, Hitler didn't didn't do a lot of different things unless he got advice from Borman uh, and all that. Uh, they're not sure what happened to Borman after the war, but some people think he died um, at the end of World War II, but he may have fled to South America. Uh, they're not sure. Now, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to kind of move on uh, to talk about uh, what happens with Hitler uh, coming to power. We're going to get to uh, and discuss how Hitler, you know, seizes power uh, in in uh, 19... Um, yeah, uh, Cameron's asking about D-Day. Yeah, we're going to get to D-Day eventually, probably, ne uh, probably not, probably next week we'll be getting to that, of course. So, but anyway, um, I'll talk, of course, a little bit about Adolf Hitler uh, and all that, how he eventually tries to seize power uh, in early on, which actually occurs in 1923. Uh, Adolf Hitler has this thing called the Beer Hall Push uh, that occurs uh, in November of 1923. November 8th to about November 9th is when it was. And um, Hitler was heavily influenced by um, um, Mu Mussolini because Mussolini had seized power in October of 1922. Uh, so he thought he could do it too. Uh, you know, quickly uh, by overthrowing the German government uh, and all that. And he had backing from some of the uh, men in the uh, German military. I'll kind of blow this up here, but you see that little soldier in the middle, the spike helmet, that's Eric von Ludendorff, who was one of the top generals uh, in World War I uh, under the Germans. I think he was right under Hindenburg uh, and second, second in, in control. And, um, Ludendorff decided to back Hitler uh, in 1923. And so Hitler basically tried to use this to seize power. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, it started on, on November November 8th is when it started. And Hitler goes into like, a, they had this beer hall, uh, like this one, Hofbrau House, uh, which is in uh, Munich, Munich, Bavaria, which is Munich, Bavaria is where, you know, the whole thing with would start, and uh, he fired a pistol in the air, pow, like in the ceiling, basically there, uh, and uh, said, "Hey, this is a revolution." You know, at this point, uh, the the that that Hofer House is still there too, uh, in Munich. I think it wasn't destroyed in the war, but uh, anyways, Hitler basically would try to seize power. About about three thousand Nazis tried to march on the government in Munich, Bavaria, seize control of all the buildings and all that, but the police came out. And they crushed it. They crushed the coup. Uh, 16 Nazis were killed uh, in, in the actual melee between the two sides. Hitler, I think, dislocated his shoulder and got hurt. And he was arrested right afterwards uh, for basically for treason at that point. And so Hitler then uh, went to prison. I think they were going to give him like five years uh, or something like that. Uh, but he ends up only serving about nine months. He served in this prison called Landsberg Prison. I think it's actually a castle that they converted into a prison uh, in Germany, which was in Bavaria. And it was there that he wrote his famous book, his political testament you may have heard of called Mein Kampf, uh, which uh, part of why he wrote it was because he kept having all these visitors coming to see him at all nights of the day. Uh, and so somebody told, hey, why don't you write a book? that kind of thing. Uh, and so starting in 1924, Hitler started writing Mein Kampf, which uh, means in German, uh, my struggle. Uh, and this book is really important, Mein Kampf, because uh, it kind of outlines um, the future of the Nazis, like what they're going to do uh, when they seize power. Uh, it also uh, was kind of like a political testament describing like his life, his early life, which was a struggle uh, going back to Austria uh, and all that. And so it was kind of seen as an autobiography. Uh, and But yeah, it did talk about a lot of things that Hitler was going to do 
uh, when when he sees power. Uh, and you can see the cell, by the way, that he lived in for about nine months uh, in Landsberg Prison. Uh, one of the ironies about Landsberg Prison is that Hitler would later use it when he took power later. It would turn into a notorious SS prison where they tortured and killed people. And that was one of the ironies of that. So I guess that was just kind of like a shrine right there you're looking at about where he actually lived. There's the actual uh, prison that he stayed in uh, for, a, for a bunch of months. Uh, he does talk about different things uh, in uh, his uh, mind conf. Uh, there's one thing he does talk about we'll get to later called Libenstrom. He talks about this idea that uh, Germany needs living space uh, to expand its empire. Uh, and so uh, that's going to be mostly seen in the East, like Poland, mostly uh, Soviet Union. Uh, and he also wants to get back territories that the Germans lost, you know, during during World War I uh, and all this. So Hitler wants revenge, you know, for the Treaty of Versailles. That's one of his big things he talked about in a lot of his speeches. And uh, Hitler was, you know, a great speaker. That's part of why people listen to him uh, and all that. But also we'll get to it. The other thing that, of course, helped to cause it was also, you know, the other big thing, you know, that led to it was the Great Depression. Uh, the Great Depression is going to, you know, create vast unemployment uh, throughout Germany. Like six million people at one point uh, will be unemployed. Uh, and so the message of Hitler really starts to be something that people start to listen to uh, at that point uh, in Germany. And that's part of why Hitler, you know, came to power uh, was because of that. There's Hitler with Hindenburg. Hindenburg, of course, the second president uh, of the Weimar Republic, of course, uh, at the time. So that's one of the things that happens, if you know about with Hitler. Hitler uh, in 1932, uh, because of the fact that he's becoming more popular uh, due to uh, the Great Depression and all that, he decides to run for president. Uh, and so uh, he runs against, you know, Paul von Hindenburg, who was basically the incumbent, uh, who had already served one term uh, at that point. And I think some people didn't really, I think Hindenburg wanted to retire at that point, uh, but they egged him to keep going, you know, because they didn't want Hitler to take power, I think is what it was. And so that that's part of part of uh, what led to that. And so, yeah, Hitler uh, did pretty good. He ended up uh, runner up uh, in the election. Uh, you can see Hindenburg got over 19 million votes uh, in, in the election. And then Hitler got a little over 13 million votes uh, right there. Well, it looks like Ernest Thalman got 3.7 million also as well. So he came in second. Hindenburg stayed in power. Uh, the only thing was what's interesting about the whole thing with Hitler you know, losing um, to uh, Hindenburg, even though he lost the election, uh, what ended up happening was the Nazis were able to gain a small majority uh, in the Reichstag because of the fact that there's so many, you know, political parties uh, in in, uh, in in the German state uh, that enabled the NSDAP to eventually gain power. Uh, so 37% of the vote uh, they got. Uh, and so because of that, Hitler Hitler's going to basically be made chancellor because he's the head of the party that has the majority uh, at that point. And so January 30th, 1933, uh, that's when Hitler, of course, uh, becomes, becomes chancellor at that point. And uh, a lot of historians believe that when Hitler is appointed to the German chancellorship, they think that's when Nazi Germany uh, starts at that point, or what they call the Third Reich. Of course, the Nazis called it the Third Reich because they said that it would last a thousand years. Because, uh, you know, the First Reich was Holy Roman Empire. You know, that Second Reich was the one under the Kaisers, like Kaiser Wilhelm II, that folded after World War I ended. And this is the Third Reich, of course, uh, we're talking about. And, uh, yeah, they, they thought that they could control Hitler. I think it was a coalition government that first came into power uh, at that point. But Hitler, within one year, is going to consolidate his power uh, to create uh, what we call a totalitarian state, a totalitarian Nazi state. And a lot of it was done 
uh, through uh, an event that happened that became real famous uh, at the beginning when Hitler came in. Uh, the Nazis used what they call the Reichstag fire to basically take control of the whole state, uh, which the uh, Reichstag fire happened in February of, of, of 1933. You get, they're going to basically use these um, things like the Reichstag fire decree and also what they call the Enabling Act to eventually gain control of the whole state. And Hitler's going to become a totalitarian dictator, of course, uh, at that point. And um, what happened was, um, there, there's the date, February 27th, 1933. Uh, the Reichstag burned down. What happened? Uh, it was caused by this man uh, named Marinus Vanderloo, uh, who you see right there. Uh, and Vanderloo was this um, Dutch communist who I think was a bricklayer, uh, who uh, happened to be also a pyromaniac. He liked to burn things down. I think he was a pyromaniac. And he was caught right afterwards, uh, confessed to it, uh, put on trial, and then later he was executed. I think I want to say in 1934 uh, afterwards. And so Hitler used that as a pretext to eventually seize power. Did Vanderloop really do it? They think he did, actually. That's something that is true about that. But I think they seem to think that Vanderloop uh, was kind of against the Nazis. Uh, he felt that if he could cause some kind of demonstration like that, that it would cause the, the German people to overthrow the Nazis and that thing. And so uh, I know years later, they pardoned Vanderloo. Uh, I think I want to say in 2008, the, the German Federal Republic pardoned him. And he's now seen as this hero that stood up, you know, uh, to the Nazis and all that. And um, Hitler, Hitler later then passed this thing uh, called, called the Reichstag Fire Decree, uh, which basically uh, banned all political parties in the country. So if you were part of some political party uh, that wasn't the Nazi party, basically you couldn't join it. Uh, also suspended people's liberties. Uh, and then the Enabling Act, uh, what that did, the Enabling Act uh, gave Hitler totalitarian powers, uh, which were for like five years. It was supposed to be only for a five-year period, but Hitler kept renewing it every five years. Renewed in 1938, and I think during World War II, he renewed it again. And so Hitler was practically like a dictator uh, in the country that could pretty much have you killed if he wanted. Uh, he was that that powerful uh, overall. There's there's Marinus van der Lube, uh, right there uh, with that image. Uh, yeah, there's the uh, Reichstag building uh, after it burned. Uh, what's really funny is uh, later the, the Nazis used an opera house. Uh, in Berlin, uh, actually has the Reichstag building. And Hitler was a big fan of um, opera, like especially Richard Wagner, if you know about that. Uh, and um, it was kind of ironic because the Reichstag after that was a rubber stamp. Uh, it was in power, I think, up to 1945, but it didn't really mean anything because uh, Hitler had, you know, total power. Uh, there's the actual uh, Reichstag building today, which is where the Bundstag uh, meets, which is the main, you know, main parliament or diet uh, of, of the German state, uh, what you see there, which has been restored, the building, except for the roof, was not built the way it was before, uh, you can see there. Now, of course, one of the things that happened afterwards was Hitler then began to consolidate his power uh, under Nazi Germany, and they had this thing uh, that was called the it's called all kinds of names. The, the, I think the common name they call it is the Rom Purge, uh, where uh, they began to eliminate enemies uh, that were under Hitler, that were a threat to his power. And so Ernest Rom was arrested uh, at one point. He's the one that's got the scar in his face, if you notice that on the left. Uh, and uh, they basically, um, they had Rom killed, and they took the SA and they merged with the Wehrmacht, the German armed forces, uh, afterwards. I think they also, Hitler took people that were like uh, leftists or liberal people that they had liberal people in the Nazi party. They, they eliminated them. I think Julius Stryker, I think, was one they got rid of as an example because some of them were pro socialists that were under Hitler. Some of the Nazis were pro social, but they got rid of them. They killed them all off, uh, basically. 
And so the Nazis were totally anti-communist, you know, uh, after that. Uh, with, uh, by the way, uh, with Hitler doing this, uh, what happened next, uh, Hindenburg then died in August of 1934 of natural causes. And so that left Hitler pretty much in total control uh, afterwards. And so what he did was he took the chancellorship, which he had, and he merged with the presidency. And uh, this became known as the Fuhrer, which means leader. Uh, and it was done in a huge national referendum where 40, 50 million people voted uh, throughout Nazi Germany. It's like a plebiscite where you vote yes or you vote no. And uh, 38 million people voted yes for Hitler, which was like about 90 percent of the population. And about a little over, I think it's like 4.3 million uh, voted no against Hitler. I'm not sure what happened to the ones that voted no. <laughs> They, they probably were harassed afterwards, I'm sure. And I don't know what happened to them. Maybe some even killed uh, because of it. But, um, yeah, you even see Hitler, you know, start to, you know, uh, he's going to take over, take power. Uh, and, um, oh, they even see slogans. Like, uh, you'll hear about, you know, slogans they start using afterwards by Hitler, which uh, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer, uh, one people, one empire, one leader, uh, that kind of thing. And so everybody starts, you know, calling the fear afterwards and using the Nazi salute and things like that. You start seeing, of course, pretty much become the norm uh, throughout throughout Europe. Now, I'm going to next talk about the other thing that happens, of course, as well, which, you know, Hitler is going to defy, of course, the Treaty of Versailles. That's one of the big things. And you're going to see uh, basically Nazi Germany starting to kind of emerge as a major power uh, in the 1930s. Uh, one thing that happened that Hitler did starting in the 1930s, he began to rearm the country, uh, like their their military, the Wehrmacht, uh, began to expand its army. Uh, they they began drafting men uh, by the several millions uh, into uh, the German armies. Uh, they began to expand the German navy. Uh, they built one of the largest uh, air forces uh, in Europe, the German Luftwaffe, which was you know, commanded or controlled by uh, Hermann Goering, who was, by the way, an ex-World uh, War One ace that knew the Red Baron. Uh, and um, so you start seeing that going on. And uh, one of the big things that happens, you can see there, is that they even formed this alliance with uh, Italy, the so-called Rome-Berlin axis, or so-called axis powers, uh, start to emerge uh, by the mid-late mid 1930s. So-called, yeah, Rome-Berlin axis, I think what Mussolini called it originally. So you get these two fascist states start to kind of align uh, militarily, economically, you know, trading with each other uh, and all of that. They start, they, they're called later the so-called axis powers, of course, uh, in World War II. And uh, later, uh, Japan would join. Uh, they would uh, form an alliance uh, with, with Nazi Germany. Uh, in, in Italy, uh, which was, I think, given a nickname later called the Tripartite Pact uh, in 1940. It's kind of an odd alliance. You know, the Japanese, you know, with the with the Europeans, like German, Italy, but both were seen as like states that were kind of militaristic, nationalistic, fascist, that were against the other powers in, in the world. And so they kind of saw themselves as kind of being equals, uh, fighting off uh, the allies in the war, which later the allies are countries like you know, Britain, France, uh, Soviet Union, United States, China, uh, et cetera. So, yeah, yeah, there, of course, there's the, um, you can see Hitler with Mussolini, of course, on the left, giving the salute uh, right there. Yeah, Hitler said it best, today we rule Germany, tomorrow the world. So, of course, Empire of Japan would try to do the same thing. They would try to take over uh, parts of Asia, uh, the Pacific, uh, Italy wanted to take over, like North Africa, uh, as an example. And so uh, these Axis powers will try to, you know, take over the world, but they'll be eventually defeated, you know, uh, luckily, in, of course, in World War II. Now, another thing I did want to talk about, which is kind of something on the side uh, as well, a lot of these fascist states uh, backed uh, Francisco Franco. You may have heard of him. Uh, Franco was this uh, Spanish general that seized control 
of Spain uh, during what they call the Spanish Civil War, uh, which broke out uh, in 1936. And uh, for a long time, if you know about this, uh, Spain was actually a republic. Uh, you know, it didn't have monarchs anymore uh, at that time. And it led to a different divide you know, between different sides that, that supported, you know, both in, in, in the war. And uh, the two sides were mostly these. You had the um, Republican side, uh, which was backed by um, mostly the Soviet Union. Uh, and you had people like the socialists, uh, the communists, oh, even at anarchists, they say that supported them as well, which uh, they say the 1930s was the peak of anarchism in Europe uh, and stuff like that. And the nationalist side uh, was backed by fascists like Germany, Italy, you know, Hitler and Mussolini uh, pretty much backed them, sent military forces uh, in there uh, as well. Spanish military was involved on the fascist side, uh, conservatives, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, you know, and monarchists that wanted to put the monarchy back in uh, were also in there. They were all called Francoists, the ones that supported it. And um, Franco... Um, it's kind of debated about whether he was a fascist or not. I think some people kind of refer him to as being the semi-fascist. He's definitely right-wing uh, for sure. Even the United States later supported, you know, about this uh, Franco's Spain uh, as well. Uh, but Franco did do something that was interesting. 1970s, uh, he restored the actual uh, constitutional monarchy of Spain, like in 1975. And so... Uh, I think some people refer to that as the so-called Spanish miracle. Uh, they dubbed it uh, and all that, uh, where Spain and even its economy actually kind of flourished uh, afterwards as well. And so, yeah, Franco Franco was kind of a uh, unusual character uh, when he had all these other people. But Spain Spain itself stayed neutral, you know, uh, during the Spanish Civil War. Uh, but they did tend to support like Nazi Germany, you know, in the war if you know about that. And I think the Nazis even had agents and others that, that went into Spain uh, and all that uh, during World War II. Now, I'm going to talk about the main thing, of course, today, which, of course, you know, is that Nazi Germany is going to start expanding, of course, uh, by the mid mid to late 30s. And uh, Hitler, Hitler wanted revenge for the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, that's, like I said, the thing that Hitler talked about the most uh, in a lot of his speeches uh, in Germany. Uh, and um, they wanted to get back land that, that was lost after World War II because of the you know, Treaty of Versailles, which created all these other states you know, after World War I. And um, one of the first areas that he marched into was the Rhineland. If you look at that map there uh, at the top uh, in, in the left, uh, where it says Rhineland, March 1936, that's the first thing that really that the Germans took back uh, from the Allies, and that had been used as a demilitarized zone uh, between France uh, and Germany uh, after World War I. I think even that the French were even using it to, to steal or take uh, some of uh, Germ Germany's like industries, coal, things like that uh, as well. And they marched in there, and the Allies just kind of looked at them. They, they, I think he marched like 30,000, 40,000 troops in there. Uh, Hitler seized control of it. They didn't do anything about it. Uh, they think that's when they could have stopped Hitler. It was probably in 1936, uh, but they did. Uh, then there was the other thing. Oh, oh uh, let me get to this right here on the bottom. Uh, right here, you see Austria, March 1938. If you look at the bottom there, uh, then what happened was in March of 38, uh, the Germans then decided to take Austria because Hitler had talked about this in Mein Kampf too. Uh, this idea that Austria ought to join, you know, uh, Germany it was the so-called, you know, German question again, uh, who who should be part of Germany, which he thought even Austria uh, should be uh, as well. I think they tried to overthrow it at first, but then Hitler, Hitler marched in there in March of 1938, uh, forced them to do a plebiscite a referendum. Uh, and so Austria joined uh, Germany uh, in 1938, and they became part of the so-called Greater German, Greater Germany, or Greater German Reich uh, afterwards uh, until 1945. 
I think a lot of Germans were glad to, like a lot of Austrians were glad to join Germany, believe it or not, because, uh, you know, Hitler was a native Austrian and things like that. Uh, and it was seen as a great thing for him to go back to Austria and all that uh, and do that uh, at the time. But groups like Jews and others that were, you know, anti-Nazi, it was not good for them. Uh, that. Uh, of course, the other big thing that happened that that really is going to cause, you know, why Hitler seizes power uh, is uh, the West was really weak after World War One. Uh, the League of Nations was formed in 1920, didn't really do enough to really stop the rise of fascism uh, in Europe. And then on top of that, countries like Britain and others, France, uh, re prefer to use what they call appeasement uh, to prevent war from breaking out. Uh, they preferred, you know, diplomacy uh, over threatening war uh, to prevent future war. And so that allowed Nazi Germany to eventually, you know, take control of Europe, causing World War II to break out in 1939. And one of the major issues that helps to cause World War II break out uh, is the so-called, um, they call it the um, Sudetenland crisis. It was one of the things that really causes almost World War II to break out uh, in 1939. And it was a conflict over Sudetenland, which was a type of territory uh, that was part of uh, what was now Czechoslovakia. Uh, in fact, it was like the Western part of Czechoslovakia is what it was. And it was a pro-German area where about 3 million Germans lived. Uh, and the Nazis wanted, uh, wanted to take it back. Basically, I'll kind of show you a map right here, but all those areas that are kind of in that brown area were areas that Hitler wanted to take uh, because they had Germans living there that spoke, you know, the German language for, I guess they're culturally, cultural Germans. And um, so Hitler kind of used it as a pretext to go in there and take control of that. And it creates this crisis where it forces countries like Britain and France uh, to intervene. And so you have what they call the so-called Munich Conference. And um, you see on the far left there, you have ne Neville Chamberlain. He flies to actual Germany to meet with Hitler uh, a couple times. And um, they eventually have this thing that's called the Munich Agreement, uh, or some people call it the so-called Munich Pact, uh, where they agree to give Hitler uh, control of the Sudetenland in exchange for peace, because uh, Hitler was threatening to take that whole territory uh, if they didn't give it to him, which might mean war. And so on September 29th, 1938, uh, they agreed to these terms where they would give it to him. And so Czechoslovakia is a state, you know, viable state at that point. They get territory taken because of this uh, whole issue. They get sold down the river uh, is, is what happened. Uh, this whole thing, the, the Munich Agreement was really one of the best examples of appeasement uh, in Europe. Uh, a lot of people think that uh, Neville Chamberlain was kind of one of the, the archetypes that really kind of created appeasement, you know, after World War I or was one that supported it the most. Uh, but it was supposed to prevent World War II, uh, but it ended up actually causing it uh, instead. Uh, Chamberlain, of course, there he is right there, shaking hands with Hitler. He's on, uh, Chamberlain's on the far left. Uh, Chamberlain would later uh, make the famous statement when he came back to England uh, afterwards uh, in 1938. He would say famously, I believe it is peace for our time. Uh, and uh, they think that Chamberlain was really naive about Hitler. He thought Hitler was a man uh, that he could trust. Uh, and he didn't understand how evil Hitler was and what his ambitions really were uh, with Nazi Germany uh, and all that. And so uh, that that's something. He even had this piece of paper you may have heard about that he had Hitler sign saying that he wasn't going to take any more land <laughs> after the Sudetenland, and it turns out to be totally false. Because uh, really within 
a few months right afterwards, uh, the Nazis then march in uh, in early, like I think what I'd say in the spring of 1939, uh, they take over the rest of like the western part of Czechoslovakia, which you see there, and they turn it into a German protectorate that was called Bohemia and Moravia. Uh, then, then the Nazis marched into the eastern part. They took Slovakia uh, also as well. They gobbled that up. Uh, and so at that point, you're going to see that happen. Uh, and then Hitler's going to, he's next going to take Poland, uh, which is right next to it, like to the, to the east. Uh, and so uh, that's going to, of course, all lead to, of course, World War II uh, breaking out. You can see here all the territory that Nazi Germany starts taking that whole dark gray area right there. And then he's going to invade, of course, Poland uh, also uh, as well. So kind of talking about, you know, how Hitler, you know, as a fascist dictator, uh, used his power to take control of, of Germany. He did it democratically. That's the thing about it. And he turned it into this totalitarian state. Uh, and then from there, began to expand you know, Germany, Germany militarily. And then from there, take back territory, because basically the West was weak uh, at that point uh, between the wars. That's going to, of course, lead to eventually, like I said, World War II breaking out, uh, you know, in, in September 1939. So I'll talk about that uh, later in the week. I think on Wednesday, I'll kind of, of course, move on. We'll talk about the uh, early stages of World War II. We'll talk about, you know, how the war breaks out uh, in, when, when Nazi Germany invades Poland. So we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about also uh, the beginning stage of the war where uh, France, France and Britain fight initially in the beginning uh, against against Nazi Germany. Uh, France doesn't fare well. They they collapse, of course, uh, but um, Britain kind of survives. You know, if you know about this under Prime Minister Winston Churchill, we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll also talk about how Nazi Germany invades the Soviet Union, 1941, which a lot of people think that was a major turning point in the war. Now, I'll also get to uh, at, I think at the end, later in the week, we'll talk about uh, the beginning of how the United States enters the war, 1941, uh, because the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. So I'll talk about that later in the week. So.